This is Health and Society, a podcast series featuring early career researchers from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London with interviewer Nigel Warburton. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk. Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton. Joining me today is Julia Cavaliera, a Wellcome Trust-sponsored PhD student in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. The topic we're going to focus on is eugenics and reproductive technologies. Let's start with eugenics. What does that mean? Eugenics etymologically means good birth, but it is uh, normally uh, connected, or at least when people hear the word eugenics, they always uh, think about Nazism and Nazi eugenics. So even if it's just a word that means good birth, it is usually understood as a really, really bad word. But it's got a longer history than the history of Nazism, surely? Yeah, and that's exactly one of the reasons why I'm interested in the history of eugenics because Nazi eugenics was just one particular type of eugenics, but actually eugenics practices were much more spread around in Europe, in the US and even in South America and they were advocated by different kind of people. So not only Nazi people interested in race, but also people that were concerned with the development of the population and of evolution. But it also occurs in animal breeding, generally in breeding of plants. There's a sense in which there has been a long history of human beings trying to control how biological organisms turn out. And one of the effective ways of doing that is by thinking about who gets to breed and who doesn't. I think the problem is when we go from plants and animals to human beings. And this is also something that happens in other fields. As long as we do experiments on animals and plants, that's considered as something acceptable or inevitable. Whereas when we go from animals and plants to humans, then people are concerned that we either go back to the Nazi type of eugenics or that actually what we are doing is exactly eugenics. But surely by selecting a mate, you know, as a human being, you engage, if you have offspring, in a kind of eugenics. You choose somebody who you like the look of, who maybe has blue eyes, or if you like blue eyes, who has blonde hair, if you like blonde hair. You know, those things increase the likelihood that your off- offspring are going to turn out a bit like that person. I think is a mixture of protection of humans, so considering human having a special status and also a sort of worry uh, of introducing a technological spin to the eugenics that you're talking about. So even if uh, people are okay or is acceptable to look for a husband, for example, or for a wife with blue eyes, having in the back of your mind that your child will have blue eyes, when actually people or scientists especially, when they do that technically, then people start to be worried. So could you give an example of a technology where the issue about eugenics has come up recently? One of the most targeted technologies, or at least by this critique, is pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is a sort of technology that allows embryo created through in vitro fertilization to be screened for genetic disease. The critique is that by screening embryo and selecting only the quotation mark, the best one to implant in utero, you are practicing a sort of eugenics. Just to get clear, what are we screening out here? Normally, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is used to screen embryos to check if they have any genetic disease. And the most common ones are monogenic diseases, so diseases that are on one gene, and so they are really easy to screen for, and are, for example, Huntington disease, or one type of Alzheimer, or cystic fibrosis. So in, in these cases, you identify the gene that is the likely cause of a disease, and you eliminate it, or you eliminate the embryo which carries that gene? 
Exactly. So you discard the embryo. Or people say you discard the embryo, which basically means you eliminate the embryo, and you would implant in utero only the ones that are either free of the disease or have a minor risk to develop that r- disease. So strictly speaking, that is a kind of eugenics. There's no problem. It is e- eugenics. Most people think this is eugenics, but the problem is is not thinking that this could be a form of eugenics, but is making is like throwing away the baby with the bathwater and saying, so for the reason that the technology is eugenics, we shouldn't use it anymore. Well, let's get clear about what that critique is. Is it that it's wrong because it's playing God, for instance? As a scientist, you're taking on the role of deciding which embryo will live. Yes, exactly. So this is one of the concerns. One of the concerns is that you are going to create a new breed of human and also creating some disparities between people that are selected and have no diseases and have maybe some superior characteristic and another kind of people, so another class of people that would grow up without having um, been technologically modified. And another concern is that these technologies will create an increased stigma against the people that are not technologically modified or also that are actually living with disabilities. So the disability rights movement is arguing that if you select people without deafness, for example, people that are actually deaf would be stigmatized more than they are at the moment. Well, that might be so. It may be true that that is a consequence of this. Yeah, that might be so. And this is where the state, I think, should intervene. So, for example, the state should regulate the use of these technologies. And, for example, some uses of PGD, of pain plantation genetic diagnosis, I think are really worth pursuing, whereas other, they might be just a waste of public money. Isn't there an assumption here that genetics is everything? that the environment doesn't have a part to play. Yes, this is exactly the assumption that is made. And what happens is that social context and environmental factors, so for example, epigenetics, so the influence of of the environment on genetics, is considered as a minor impact. It seems to me fairly obvious that if I had an identical twin brought up in poverty, with a traumatic childhood, beaten up, that person would turn out quite different from me despite having genetic identity. Yes, this is exactly why people are conducting, for example, twin studies to understand the influence of the environment. Since the Human Genome Project, genetics is seen as something that is defining our characteristics and there is much less research on the environmental factors and also much less um, media attention for example so people are brought into thinking that the environment has a minor influence on how we grew up the charge that a particular activity is a form of eugenics is sometimes used simply to close down debate So it's a device, a rhetorical device. If you can show that something is eugenics, that's treated as if it was sufficient to stop all research and to show that it's, it's morally wrong. What do you think about that way of arguing? Eugenics is often used as a conversation stopper, or it was called in the past also as a club. And it says that no right-minded person could possibly defend eugenics because it's such a bad practice, right? But instead eugenics and such an emotional power and such a bad reputation, then I think people should be very careful in using that word because it influences people thinking that these technologies are actually bad. So the argument they make is that pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is similar to eugenics. Eugenic was bad, therefore pre-implantation genetic diagnosis is something bad. But I think this doesn't tell the whole story about the technology. Well, let's tease out why it might be bad in this context where somebody describes it as eugenics. Is it that this is the first step towards the kind of eugenics that Hitler engaged in? Is that the argument? Yeah, this is exactly the argument that is made, so that we would start with genetic disease and trying to to select embryos that are more likely to have a healthy life. And then we start from there, and then we go to selecting people with blue eyes and blonde hair and creating a master race. 
So this is a slippery slope argument. So the idea is you take one step down the slope and you inevitably you're going to end up at the bottom. Yes, exactly. So that's what most of the people think and what I think is problematic because it distracts people's attention to the benefit and also to the actual risks of these technologies and it projects us in a sort of dystopian scenario in which we are going to end up where the Nazis were. Philosophically, slippery slope arguments have got actually quite a bad reputation because it's a, it's a style of not thinking really. You, th you just make an assumption that little steps in one direction will inevitably lead to a certain conclusion. But the truth is you have to explain why each little step will be taken. So there's no inevitability about lots of so-called slippery slopes. Just as if you're a good skier, there's no inevitability that getting on a slippery slope will mean you can't stop when you want to. Yes, this is precisely why I think slippery slope arguments are problematic in general. But in this particular field, they are even more problematic because it puts in brackets the actual aims of the parents of, for example, wanting to have a healthy child. And the idea of, of the desire of wanting to have a healthy child is compromised in a way. It, it doesn't get enough attention when the focus is on sliding down a slippery slope. And I think, as for example, some people say, we should build steps into, into this slippery slope. And this is where the state should come in and intervene into reproduction with, for example, regulations. Your argument is that things which other people describe as eugenics, well, they are eugenics, but we should avoid that word because it arouses all kinds of emotions which cloud people's judgment in the area. But also, we should recognise that it would, in principle, be possible to take these small steps one by one and end up somewhere bad. So we need external regulation by the state, perhaps internationally, to prevent those steps going all the way to the bottom. Yeah, this could be a possible solution against lying down towards eugenics. And another is, I believe, ethical argumentation that goes beyond just calling something eugenics, but saying, let's discuss and let's make an ethical assessment of these technologies, an ethical assessment that is done by including, for example, the lived story of the parents and the scientists who develop the technologies and trying to build on that the regulation and not on a cloud, as you said, a cloud judgment on something that went on in the past that, that is eugenics. It seems to me there's a real disanalogy between selecting an embryo that's so-called healthy embryo as opposed to a diseased embryo and imposing a state policy of doing this. So if you're talking about individual parents making choices about the kind of baby they hope to have, as opposed to Hitler making judgments about the kind of race that he thinks should be allowed to thrive. That's quite a different activity. It is very different. So now the focus is a lot on the individual and also on a non-interference by the state into reproductive decisions. To be honest, though, some people think that we could have a new eugenics coming on from the back door and the back door of people freely choosing as individuals to have a healthy child. And this could have the same consequences that eugenics said. And I think in that, the state should or could stop this and try to control the possible consequence, for example, by focuses on some diseases and not others. And for, for example, disease embryos and not just choosing some traits that are so-called cosmetic traits of the embryo. Most people, perhaps almost everybody, think it's great to eliminate smallpox or great to eliminate malaria, if we possibly can. Why does it matter that that's done, a, a similar activity is done by means of genetic manipulation as opposed to inoculation or uh, vaccination or destruction of mosquito habitats. Yeah, vaccination or other medical intervention are a really good comparison for this because there's a lot of faith in genetics, but there are also lots of biases against genetics. And when genetics is connected to reproduction, people fear they would actually start to control our evolution. 
and influence the sort of people we will have in the future, whereas other medical interventions are focused on the living and existing individuals and not about future general population. But surely by eliminating disease, in a sense we influence evolution, not just of that particular organism or whatever that would have given you the disease because we eliminate it, but also we allow people who would not otherwise have survived because they're vulnerable to this particular form of the disease to live long enough to procreate. So potentially, that impacts on evolution too. Yes, I think many medical intervention and also other policies, as for example, public health policies or environmental policies, they have an impact on future generation inevitably. And also just, if you think about it, just giving birth to a person or to a new person influences that person even without any technology involved. But there's a presumption against genetics because people are actually fearing that when we go from sorts of natural intervention, as for example giving birth, to actually intervene with technologies, the consequences would be much worse. And I see in that a fear of past eugenics that comes up all the time in the debate on eugenics. So eugenics casts a shadow on any genetics intervention. But isn't there a sense in which technologies which are developed in order perhaps to minimise the risks of diseases being inherited could also be used perniciously to create some kind of master race to enhance certain features. It's the same kind of technology involved. So there is a genuine fear there. That's entirely true. So, for example, that's why no technology is by itself completely risk-free and also completely immoral or moral. So if you think about, for example, nuclear energy, which is a really common example, but nuclear energy could be used for different kind of very useful things for the for the population, but could also be used to build bombs, so nuclear bombs. So th- this is something similar to what I'm arguing here for pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. The technology is itself neutral, but the uses that people choose to do could be very, very bad from a moral perspective or could be also very good and benefit prospective parents. Would it be fair to say that What you've been arguing is that there is a rhetoric in this area, the rhetoric of eugenics, which closes down thought. And we ought to be sensitive to that pattern of thought, which I think quite a few of us are are vulnerable to, the, uh, the idea that if this leads in the direction of eugenics, it must be a bad thing. Whereas slower thinking, more reasonable assessment of particular cases could lead to an awareness of differences between practices that develop from new technology and the kind of thing that Hitler was implementing. Yes, that's precisely what I'm arguing here and what I think is important to keep in mind when we talk about new technologies and especially genetic technologies due to their history. And I think it's really important to learn from this history in order not to make the same mistakes, but also to make sure that history doesn't stop any future action because we are too scared of what happened in the past. Julia Cavalieri, thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you for listening to Health in Society. This podcast series is sponsored by the Educational Fund and produced by Aidan Judd and Ellie Clifford. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk.